that question. there. The, it's it's a question. Because of the rhetoric, because of answer. the rhetoric that you and answer your friend have had to have police cars outside my house. Why don't you answer the question? Do we, do we have any questions from anybody from the town of Lineboro? Sure. You're from Lineboro? Yes. Or, of course. Yeah, Mike. You want an idea? Michael Cable. Okay, let's. Uh, I have actually a number of questions here, but I'll start with one. You mentioned. Uh, that you wanted to bring more transparency to the government. Uh, yet, on the right to work for less, you delayed the veto override vote, even though it was on the calendar and there were 390 reps there. You had closed uh, budget meetings on HR 11. Uh, you created the committee for redress, where you have the sole or the speaker has the sole authority to allow complaints. Uh, yeah, why don't we take those? Why don't we take them one by one rather than you just you know have them? So no, there's a lot of them. Let's go through them one by one. What was the first one? Uh, the right to work for less. You delayed the okay. Uh, the, the, the under our parliamentary even though it was on the calendar. As you might have known, as you picked up in one term, it's the speaker that brings the board <laughs> vetoes. The uh, speaker that rally brought forward the veto when she thought it was the appropriate. I will reserve the right to bring forward to those when I can. That is the way it's always been run. Surprise votes are not transparent. And there's no surprise votes. The Speaker Norelli brought forward her vetoes whenever she wanted to. They, they sat on the calendar week after week, and she brought them forward when she wanted to. And you think that's right? no different. You, you apparently thought it was right. I didn't hear you get up there. And, and say, oh, speaking around, you, you were in that way over there. there. <laughs> so you were in go, office when I was there. Go on. What's your next one? Uh, you had secret, secret budget meetings on HR 11 budget projections. Yes. No, uh, I didn't. No, I didn't. You created the committee for redress, uh, which you have the sole authority to allow complaints to. No, that's uh, not right. That's you not had right. a conflict of interest on the committee for redress. Why don't well, we just stop? Why don't uh, well, we just stop? <coughs> We've had a constitutional provision that for the last hundred years hasn't been respected. And that's the right of citizens to petition their, uh, their uh, legislature with their grievances. It's right in the Constitution. Um, they've tried to do it uh, uh, in recent years, and no one's listened to it. Well, Speaker Norelli took their petition and literally threw them And so we've put together a committee in order to hear their petitions for grievances respecting the Constitution. What's your next one? Uh, there was a, a conflict of interest. Oh, first of all, you, you have sole authority to decide what goes to the Committee on Redress. That's not right. That's not right to get right in. That's the way it's set up. It's not set up that way at all. It's not at all. Because it comes in like any other bill. It's, it's, it goes to, it's like any other bill. It comes in. It gets read, read into the record by the House clerk. It goes to the committee. <coughs> Michael, you don't know what you're talking about. It goes, it goes, it goes in like any other bill. It comes in, the, the legislator submits it, it goes to the Office of Legislative Services, they draft it up, it gets read into the record by the House clerk, it gets sent to the committee. What's your next one? Uh, you, you had a conflict of interest on the committee for redress. Uh, when that was discovered, the chair was not removed from the only, as far as I know, the only bill that's been heard on that committee, didn't it? No? No, no, no it's not. You, you, again, right for the lawyers. What's your next one? Um, you've, uh, what, why are we having bills right now during recess? Why are there so many sessions coming up during recess? I'm sorry, why should we do it? Because it's recess? The house is in recess, which yeah. means you can be called back in the session at any time. And you're bringing up we brought up multiple five. bills during this time of year? Which, which bill did you have an objection to? None, none in particular, just the fact that we brought up, we, we found that the local government center uh, had been misusing funds, so we brought a bill forward to allow the legislative investigation to the administration. We found that under the 2006 amendment to the Constitution, that wards of cities have to be treated like towns, and yet unlike towns, ward lines can change. So what the legislation that says by a date certain there has to be uh, redistricting by the city, so we know what would be. Why couldn't that wait till the normal session? Because uh, we because have, the Senate is not in session. Because 
Uh, we have a calendar, a schedule that has to be met from the district. If we back up, we have in June, we have to file for a, a, a new candidacy. If you back up from that, we have to go to the Department of Justice, which takes 60 to 90 days to get a redistricting plan approved, which means that we have to have it out of the House by about February 1st. So we have to have hearings in January. So we have to know what we have, what plans we're going to have in January. So we can pass it in February, get it to the Senate, have them pass it, go to the Department of Justice and get approval of it because we're a voting on state. And so that they said, so if you work through the calendar, we've got to get this done. So that's that's the reason that we're going to use it. Um, one, one thing, Mr. Speaker, that we're having trouble with here on local levels is, uh, you know, our revenues are down just like yours. Um, and, and one of the things that we have uh, a lot of difficulty funding is, is, is infrastructure, you know, our roads that we maintain in the town. And uh, fortunately, or unfortunately for Lineborough, we have a lot of roads and, and very little business, very little income aside from the residents. Is there anything at the state level that, uh, as far as either gas tax monies or, you know, I mean, we have a block net that comes in, but that's been going down. This, one thing that we did do for local towns was remove um, the permit application if you follow best practices. You don't have to go that. That's going to hopefully reduce the um, cost of doing it. The other thing we're looking into is to see if we can take the Department of Safety um, out of the Department of Transportation and separate them because highway funds have been used for non highway purposes. We're running our a homicide unit out of highway funds. And so what we're trying to do is see if we can separate them physically so we can dedicate all the highway funds to, to the upkeep of highways. So that's some of the things we're trying to do to get more money into it. Right. One of the other things we don't have available to us, um, I mean, we have, we have local road agents in all our little towns, but we really don't have engineers available to us to help us design our roads or to help us shoot a road. And it's a very expensive um, thing for us to do is hire an engineering firm to say, you know, rebuild Center Road here. Do you have, you know, and I know the State Department of Transportation has resources such as that. Is there any program that could possibly help us in, in designing a road? I, I, I don't know, but I'll check. Okay. It's not it's it's really logical the resources. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, what would be a big help is us to be able to just say, you know, we'd really like to use maybe this, this five mile section of road, but how should we, re you know, how should we do it? What do you recommend? The extent of money we're actually spending with the one right the first time is that right. we're abandoning a lot of times. Which is <laughs> yeah, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. Let's see if there's something there. And if not, if we can put something in place, that'd be great. Right uh, right Thank you. Uh, going back to the voter issue, um, I grew up here in New Hampshire, I've had to leave the state for a um, few times, come back. Uh, I've gone to school out of state, uh, went to the University of Connecticut. Uh, ma several major elections came through, several, um, including several presidential elections. It was very easy for me, you know, and luckily I had the, the choice at the time to cast my vote in at the university uh, and that's my choice and what I vote is my choice I look at an issue and make an appropriate decision uh, whether that's a liberal vote or a conservative vote doesn't matter to me I look at what the best option is um, I don't believe anybody should demonize anybody I don't think anybody should threaten anybody else but to say that to a college student uh, who's coming in from out of state, well, you can't vote here because you're coming from way out of state. Uh, college students are very busy. They have full course loads. I know when I did, you know, when I was in college, I had that too. You know, who has time to write back to their home state and get an absentee ballot when a lot of the states aren't sending out lots of, you know, aren't willing to send out absentee ballots in this time, uh, especially to military folks like myself. Uh, I and can I, can I add to you? Just 
uh, to, to understand your point. And my point is, and I recently came back to the state. I set up with one location, got my ID, uh, driver's license for it. Now I live in another 